President Houston took his oath of office at Columbia, but that location suited few Texian officials. House and Senate committees met and deliberated, but could reach no consensus regarding the location for a new governmental seat. A number of towns were in the running. Matagorda, Fort Bend, Washington, Columbia, Nacogdoches, and Houston. The representatives could not reach agreement and decided to locate the capital by a vote of both houses of Congress. At that juncture, the brothers Allen, Augustus C., and John K. instigated their machinations. They had acquired land on Buffalo Bayou, just five miles north of the ravaged Harrisburg. They swore that their new town was handsome and beautifully elevated, salubrious and well watered, and now in the very heart or center of population. Moreover, the devious brothers offered the politicians many inducements. The brothers promised to build and pay for a Capitol building. They also offered the congressmen private lodgings and complimentary town lots. Enticed by all the honeyed payoffs, on December 15, 1836, the people's representatives passed legislation transferring the seat of government to Houston until the end of the legislative session, 1840. By year's end, Texians began to make their way to Houston City. What they found shocked and surprised them. Despite the Allen brothers' lavish descriptions, Houston was nothing more than marks on a chart and stakes in the ground. Arriving on New Year's Day, 1837, merchant Francis R. Lubbock witnessed a few citizens constructing frame buildings on newly acquired lots. Other enterprising Houstonians, unable to afford lumber, pitched tents and conducted business under canvas. Prophetically, one of the larger tents functioned as a saloon. Houston City had already begun to assume its distinctive character. By April 28, 1837, the capital had grown by leaps and bounds. On that date, President Sam Houston, the city's namesake, boasted, on the 20th of January, a small log cabin and 12 persons were all that distinguished it from the adjacent forest. And now there are upwards of 100 houses finished and going up rapidly, some of them fine frame buildings, and 1,500 people, all actively engaged in their respective pursuits. It is remarkable to observe the sobriety and industry like we see in the north. I have not seen a drunken man since my arrival. This last aspect would not last. Soon the city would provide the president with the opportunity to view more toss pots than even he would have thought possible. By November 19th, when Methodist minister Littleton Fowler arrived in Houston, his impression was far different. Here I find much vice, gaming, drunkenness, and profanity, the commonest. By 1838, the Allen brothers' dream had become a nightmare. <laughs> what began as an impromptu hamlet had morphed into a makeshift metropolis, and it suffered from all the ills of haphazard development. Even the most zealous booster had to admit that much of the year Houston City 
was a contaminated cesspit. In the summer, swarms of flies carried the bacteria that caused dysentery. Winter brought typhus, influenza, cholera, and tuberculosis. Almost yearly yellow fever epidemics swept the city, claiming vast numbers of victims. One official was dead on target when he referred to this detested, self-polluted, isolated mud hole of a city. Dr. John Washington Lockhart described Houston's thoroughfares. The avenues were very muddy, and it was not an unusual thing then and long afterward to see ox wagons bogged down on the principal streets. Dr. Lockhart further recalled that he had seen the roads lined with carcasses. Frequent rains liquefied the black dirt and horse droppings. Wagon wheels whipped the mixture into a putrid slime. Add raw sewage, and the stench was nauseating. The place smelled less like a town than a charnel house. Houstonians suffered a dazzling assortment of vermin, but rats were the worst. As soon as they snuffed out their candles, the skip of the repulsive pest lulled them into slumber. Gustav Dresel, a young German immigrant, described the scourge of these loathsome creatures. Thousands of these troublesome guests made their sport by night, and nothing could be brought to safety from them. All the provisions were soon be gnawed by them, and the best rat dog became tired of destroying them because their numbers never ceased. Human corpses had to be watched during the whole night because otherwise these fiends ate their way into them. The finger of a little child who lay alone in the cradle for a few hours was half eaten away. This I saw by myself. Rats often dashed across me by the half dozens at night. In the beginning, this proves annoying. Of course, later one gets accustomed to it. One might accuse Dresel of hyperbole if others had not corroborated his observations. Settler C.C. C. Cox confirmed. I cannot convey an idea of the multitude of rats in Houston at that time. They were almost as large as prairie dogs, and when night came on, the streets and houses were literally alive with these animals. Such running and squealing throughout the night, to say nothing of the fear of losing a toe or your nose, if you chanced to fall asleep, created such an apprehension that together with the attention that had to be given our other companions made sleep well nigh impossible. Nacogdoches representative Kelsey H. Douglas had nothing good to say about the Capitol. Shamefaced, he admitted in a letter to his wife, we live like hogs. <laughs> More than a few shared his belief that Houston City was the most miserable place in the world.